second speaker of the day is um, under the theme of photographic visibilities is uh, Katie Turner. Katie is an independent researcher with a PhD in theology and religious studies from King's College in London. And the title of her talk, as she already pointed out, is Victorian Palestinians as Biblical Jews, how long-standing Christian bias impeded knowledge of ancient Jewish dress. Thank you very much. Thank you. At the dawn of the 19th century, a growing interest in the history and archaeology of the Levantine region, rooted in Victorian Romanticism, was spurred by a new rational or scientific approach to biblical studies that had emerged in the previous century and the monumental 1748 discovery of Pompeii. Palestine did not deliver the sort of phenomenal archaeology many had hoped, no glorious kingdom of David, but this did not dampen the desire to explore the biblical land and to develop a more quote unquote historically accurate understanding of the biblical world. At the night, oh, I can't move forward in my slide. Oh, okay, I got it, sorry. Um, as the 19th century drew to a close, the travel writing travel guide genre had amassed a huge body of work that valorized the idea of accuracy through observation and promoted the notion that it was possible to see the past through details visible to the Victorian observer. This was a time that treated personal experience as akin to scientific data and physical presence in a locale as a primary source in and of itself. Following its invention in 1839, photography quickly became a principal method for capturing and distributing this primary material. As historian Paul Chevedin states, photography, quote, emerged not as an art form, but as an accurate and highly efficient means of transmitting visual information. Photographs, even better than textual description of an observation, gave the appearance of capturing reality. In this rendering, photography books, such as the five volume Souvenir Dorian, produced by French photographer Félix Bonfils from his Beirut studio, Maison Bonfils, provided the reader with the opportunity to become expert themselves, to truly understand the biblical world through a secondary witnessing. However, photographs were not dispassionate facsimiles of the world as it is, produced free from bias or creative intervention. Quite the contrary, photographers were judicious in their decisions. In some case, cases, staging studio portraits of models dressed and accessorized according to constructed ethnic categories like this example of Bedouin violin players from Maison Bonfils. As Ali Badad observes, quote, nothing belies the myth of naturalness or objectivity in Victorian Orientalist photography more than the staged studio portrait. Holy land photographs tend to fall into one of two categories. Either we see landscapes and cityscapes devoid of people, as in the images that fill the five volumes of Souvenir Dorian, the absence is particularly stark in this picture of Bethlehem, or they feature subjects who appeared like the land, timeless and unchanging. Bedouin tribes in particular, pastoral and archaic seeming captured imaginations. Portraits were tightly cropped around a natural background or people were recorded engaging in the type of agricultural or pastoral activity reminiscent of a biblical way of life. Excised nearly entirely are any trappings of modernity. This is why Bonfils' photograph of the Yaffa Gate, capturing a modern restaurant and a bustling street filled with mid-century carriages, did not make it into Souvenir Dorian. The images that were preferred were those upon which the Victorian could project their desire to witness the Bible themselves, that projection then presumed to be historically accurate. In Palestine Through the Stereoscope by Jesse Lyman Holbert and Charles Foster Kent, a photo of a barley harvest is described thus. That gray bearded turban farmer stands there at ease. His name might be Boaz for aught we know. Ruth may have looked like one of these women wrapped around the head with a coarse veil and dressed in garments as common as these. The contemporary situation in Palestine and the distinct histories, cultures and traditions of the diverse people who lived in the region was of no real interest as an object of study. As historian Asim, Asim Nasser writes, Palestine was reduced to a backdrop upon which the biblical story could be substantiated rather than recognized as a real place in the real world. Artists bridged the gap between observed reality and the notion of a monolithic static holy land to show biblical scenes styled after 19th century Palestine. Horace Vernet's painted figures in his Judah and Tamar on the right and Joseph's coat on the left, for example, are nearly indistinguishable from his paintings of contemporary scenes, such as the one in the middle, that he produced during a trip to the East in 1839. 
By the end of the 19th century, these conclusions regarding a biblical past filled with Bedouin peoples were brought to life by the new medium of film. It is there that they have remained, filling the public consciousness with inaccurate ideas of ancient Jewish dress rooted in Victorian quote unquote accuracy. While this constructed Bedouinish aesthetic is indeed a product of the 19th century propagated by carefully curated photographic images, the thought process that underpinned it, that personal observation is akin to objective data, that the predominantly Muslim inhabitants of the modern Levant live an ahistorical existence and are thus representative of the Jews of antiquity, that the physical landscape itself is unchanged by time, is decidedly older and thus even more entrenched in our society and therefore harder to push back against than we might realize. Western Christendom began to equate Jews with Muslims around the start of the First Crusade. Previously, the Jew had been the dominant counterpoint to Christendom. Now, frequent contact with the peoples of the East necessitated a reevaluation. In 1095, Pope Urban II spoke of holy war, of the need to reclaim the land God had given to the people of Israel, now understood as Christendom itself, from cursed barbarians alienated from God, i.e. the Muslims. He fostered a sense of unity across Western Christendom for the first time and declared violence against the enemy an act of salvation and redemption. The Crusaders naturally merged their two enemies into one, burning villages and slaughtering hundreds of Jews on their way to fight the Muslim. Once arrived in the Holy Land, they encountered people in turbans, front open coats and wide belts. Slowly, these details began to make their way into biblical art, fusing with derogatory schemata already applied to Jews. The enemies of Christ were reimagined as the Eastern enemies of Christendom. Although there is considerable amount more that could be said on the early Western Orientaliz Orientalization of the biblical Jewish world, I would like to focus on two important developments. The Peregrinatio of Ter Aterum Sanctum in the 15th century and the emergence of the Orientalist scholar in the 18th century. When Bernhard of Bredenbach traveled to Jerusalem in the mid 15th century, he took the artist Erhard Reuwich with him, together producing the first illustrated pilgrim's guide. Bredenbach recounted the history of the land from the perspective of Western Christendom, of course, described contemporary trade between East and West, and commented on at every opportunity, the detestable character of the Muslim people that occupied the region. Though the content of Bredenbach's writing did not differ much from earlier pilgrim's guides, the value of the first person point of view is emphasized to an unprecedented extent. Breidenbach claims that he knows and understands that which he writes about because he saw it. Reuwich's presence and his illustrations become testimony to the special knowledge gained through eyewitness. And Breidenbach substantiates his own claims with an additional, the artist saw this. The reader can then proceed to the corresponding illustration and see, yes, in fact, the artist did see that. As F. Thomas Noonan writes, a whole new non-textual lens was turned on. Reuwich's woodcuts are presented in an encyclopedic fashion, a compendium of ostensibly objective depictions of the culture and environment encountered. As with the photographs we've seen, Reuwich presents the Holy Land through a biblical lens. The sole image that shows human activity, one of Syrians in a vineyard, is one that demonstrates archaic seeming agriculture. Think here of the barley harvest I showed you just a minute ago. Reuwich's holy sites are free from the imposition of non-Christian figures. In the case of the Holy Sepulcher, this meant excising the building's Muslim wardens and representing the site as desired, not as it was. Consider Reuwich's version against Felix Bonfils's and Auguste Salzman's. Eastern Mediterranean peoples, Saracens, Greeks, Syrians, Abyssinians, and Turks are illustrated according to ethnicity as was understood then, of course. And then in some instances, subdivided into smaller categories, male and female or cleric and layman, a systemization of observable fact and a precursor to the staged studio portrait. The ethnographic impulse reverberated through the 19th century as well, demonstrated in these examples from Maison Bonfils entitled, A Group of Druze Sheiks and A Group of Young Druze Girls. These photographs, like Reuwich's illustrations, lack context and depth of comprehension. We are seeing the typification of ethnic categories, a flat representation of type that allowed for comparisons to be drawn between Western Christendom and the other. And so we find a single Jew in Reuwich's woodcuts, despite a stated population in Jerusalem at the time of over 500 Jewish persons. 
Rojek's Jew is a moneylender, appearing in clothes more in keeping with common Western dress and literally deposing a client of his shirt. This image contributes nothing to the exercise of understanding biblical history, but instead helps to confirm Western anti-Semitic stereotyping under a veneer of accuracy. That this figure was likely a figment of Rojek's imagination is a conclusion supported by his woodcut illustrating wildlife encountered, which posturously includes a unicorn and a bipedal lion. Underneath the caption, it reads, the animals are truly portrayed as seen in the Holy Land. Yes, truly. Bradenbach's Peregrinatio purported to provide a window into the landscape, architecture, and clothing culture of the biblical period itself, whereby the contemporary residents of Jerusalem and the city surrounds are conceived of as either unchanged or as appropriate substitutions for the peoples of the past. Subsequent pilgrims' guides, ethnographies, and costume books, picture Bibles, and pattern books proliferated a more precise knowledge of the Eastern Mediterranean and Levant than had previously been held. Driven by a new celebration of realism, artists of the 15th and 16th centuries, and then on into the modern era, used this accumulated knowledge to more quote unquote accurately depict the biblical world. During the early 18th century, the Western gaze shifted from the Ottoman Turk to the Arab as naturalistic principles began to be applied to the study of Christian texts. Dutch philologist Albert Schultens proposed an interpretation of the Old Testament through cross comparison with Arabic, in which Arabic was considered more archaic than Hebrew and thus given priority. A true understanding of the Old Testament could only be gained through the perceived relationship between the ancient Israelites and contemporary Arabic speaking peoples, Schultens argued. Building on Schulten's work, Johann David Michaelis writes, everything we know about Arabic customs coincides so exactly with the most ancient customs of the Israelites and thus gives the richest and most beautiful elucidations to the Bible. For Michaelis, Jews had been so long in the diaspora that, quote, one can no longer see in them the descendant of the people in whom the Bible speaks, end quote. No matter that there were Jewish communities resident in the Levant at that very moment, or, and this is more important, that one should not look to any contemporary population as prototype of a past society. Michaelis is simply reproducing for the modern age a sentiment that is almost as old as Christianity itself, that the Jewish people have nothing of value to offer regarding their own scripture, and he is attaching the conclusion that they know little of their own history and language as well. In the 1760s, Michaelis directed a research expedition to the Arabian Peninsula, after which he published extensively on biblical texts. His work and that of other Orientalists, such as his former student, August Ludwig von Schlötzer, creator of the philological label Semitic, inspired many others across Western Europe and Protestant America to take similar journeys to the Holy Land, and this leaves us off where we began. The 19th century exploration of the Holy Land by Western travelers was born of a genuine academic urge, and yet we may consider it one protracted exercise in confirmation bias. During this time, the biblical world, long perceived as exotic and oriental, was confirmed to be so. During this time, the inhabitants of the land, their language and their culture, considered archaic and ahistorical even in the 15th century, was again confirmed to be so. And though this perception benefited the Western traveler hoping to witness the biblical past, it also boast, bolstered for him the notion that Christianity is a civilizing, modernizing force. The availability of vast quantities of these photographs to the public through praiseworthy digitization efforts may continue to unintentionally propagate these conclusions, especially as they now, due to their age, communicate an additional antiquatedness to the modern viewer. Over the last century, and particularly in the last 50 years, considerable scholarship has been produced on the history of the Second Temple period. This has quite resoundingly demonstrated that the material culture, much like the literary, philosophical, and theological culture, have been deeply influenced by the Greek and later the Roman world. Textile remains, of which we have many, and literary references to dress and appearance demonstrate clothing that did not differ from Greco-Roman norms and reveal a population skilled in their manufacture. Typical dress of the first century Jew consisted of a woolen tunic often decorated by two vertical bands, clavi in Latin. Though sleeveless, it would have been wide enough to create the appearance of sleeves when belted. Knee length was standard for men, while the female tunic fell to mid-calf or to the floor for those who could afford it. Over the tunic, one wore a mantle, a rectangle of fabric draped across the body, the progenitor of the contemporary talit. This would have concealed one's tunic length and belt when worn. Upper-class women likely veiled, in keeping with their Grecian neighbors, while men would commonly be bareheaded, 
Beards were not in fashion until the mid second century. Loose hair on women would have been disparaged and men kept their hair short. Overall, there is little evidence for anything identifiably Jewish about Jewish dress of this period and no evidence that the residents of Judea dressed like their Parthian Iranian neighbors to the east. These frescoes from the interior of a third century synagogue in Duryeropis, the earliest evidence of Jewish self depiction, correspond to the material evidence that we have to give a reasonable approximation of what I've outlined, though they do include short, include short beards on the men, which had by then become fashionable. As dress behavior reveals much about a society, its norms and its values, it is a shame that this aspect of biblical history, of Jewish history, is largely unheard of. Better digitization and thus better public accessibility of objects and textiles related to the material culture of the Second Temple New Testament period appropriately contextualized alongside finds from the Greco-Roman world would aid considerably in shifting perception and opening minds beyond the ahistorical stereotype. Currently, such digital efforts are quite minimal. It is the picture developed by 19th century photographers that remains lodged in the public consciousness in which the Jews of the biblical period with their wide sleeved open front Bedouin coats, broadly striped textiles and Arabic kafaya and turbans are little more than an orientalized figment of the Christian imagination. Thank you. <laughs>